Hello, this is Marguerite Fleming from GrowthFinder Pro, and I am so excited to do this interview today with Harry Alexander. Um, Harry has over 38 years of sales education experience, and he's going to share with you pearls of wisdom. Um, he's one of Canada's uh, topmost educators in the area of sales. He's delivered results that you just wouldn't even believe. Um, so if you want results, you need to listen to Harry. I'm thrilled to have him here. Um, so I want you to do a little bit of an introduction, Harry. So tell us a little bit about you and your background. Okay, my background, um, I started off as a young man with IBM. I became uh, their number one sales executive. And then I went on to um, Philips Information Systems, where I had one of the most exhilarating, educational, and exciting experiences in my career. I headed up all sales education for North America for Phillips. I sure found out real fast what worked in the boardroom doesn't necessarily work out on the street and vice versa. And the vice versa was scary. Our sales management and upper management didn't know what was going on on the front lines because they weren't out there too often. So I changed that. I went on for a very successful career with Phillips and then founded Townsend and Alexander in 1984. We founded the company primarily because I used to hire guys like me and ladies. And frankly, flash, dash, great talk, great entertainment, but three or four months later, back in the rocking chair, same old, same old, not the results that we wanted. So we formed Townsend and Alexander by saying, we're not gonna do that. We're going to provide results operating margins, inventory turns, revenue levels, and when you can measure it, market share. So I'd like to briefly share some of those results with you. Um, and by share, perhaps I could go to the share screen right now and um, do that while we're uh, here. Just a second. Mm. Where's the share, share screen, and there, can you see that? Not yet. Marguerite? I can't okay. see it yet. Well, let's just try that again then. Good. You can see that? There you are. Great. Good. Here's some of the results we've done at Townsend and Alexander. Bank of Nova Scotia, a 400% increase in revenues holding the profit in two years. It was a sales record. They had more proposals in their history and closed their biggest commercial order ever. Anecdotal information, Montreal Trust was a subsidiary of Bank of Nova Scotia at that time. It was a chronic underperformer. After two days of discovering what the heck was going on, we knew exactly what their problems were. And this is a guilty, guilty, guilty of most financial institutions. First problem, salespeople were spending less than 3% of their time on sales activities. What were they doing with the 97%? You go to any major banking institution, stockbroker, any financial services company, financial services company, leasing companies, they're all guilty of that. They spend over 90% of their time, uh, paperwork, preparing, researching. Excuse me, you gotta reverse those numbers. Sales compensation was based on salary with discretionary bonuses. Not gonna exactly get excited about that, are you? We delivered sales programs supported by an awards program, revenues jumped. 400%. So people respond to love. And that's what the awards program was love. However, money sure allows you to get that love and style. We're going to get to money in a moment. CIBC 287.6% mm -hmm. of target. They never in all of their regions across Canada even came close to breaking that target. Got them number one. Thank you for the excellent work you did with our sales team, the district manager. Here's the bad news. Anecdotal information. They never re-engaged our services again. Say what? Yeah. We were told that historical acceptable results for the bank were in the range of 3 to 5%, not 287.6. The culture of the bank was simply not a fit with Townsend and Alexander. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to get into two areas that no sales consulting companies cover. One is egos, the executive egos at the top. How the heck do you handle that? Any sales programs on how do you handle big egos? Well, we have them, but I've never seen anybody in my life handle it. The second, this is brutal. 
Learn as you go and watch the price for this corporate politics. How are things politically acceptable around here? Are we allowed to do that? Hit a home run for 287% and make our upper management look like jerks? No, no, we're not. So you got to be aware of the culture. We'll get to that on your question number 10, Marguerite, that you're going to ask me, which was great. Citibank, United States, a 52% increase over the 10-month average prior to this. And this is only one branch, this 233 grand. Fred John, anecdotal. They improved these superior results and then put incentive compensation into place. They paid their salespeople more money out of the profits, so it was self-funding, and the award programs love sales records never before achieved. Mercedes-Benz, perhaps our best results ever, a $420 million increase in annual truck sales with a 7% market share increase during a depressed truck market is remarkable. It's a trucking division of Mercedes-Benz. Bob Warner, director of marketing, one of the smartest men I've ever had the privilege of working with in marketing. Before Townsend and Alexander came along, Mercedes-Benz trucking had never made a profit were considering withdrawing from the North American market to concentrate on their profitable automobile division. Mercedes-Benz then became the number one truck company in North America. They're now number one in the world after only four years with Townsend and Alexander. So we do know what we're doing and we fulfill our mission statement. That's what uh, we're able to do. That's what Townsend and Alexander can do. Now, I believe you're going to be asking me some questions I at am. this point, Marguerite. I am, I am. And I, I mean, that's pretty impressive, right? Um, who doesn't want those kind of results? Speak to the fact, I mean, these are incredible examples. Do you I'm going work... to try to, I'm going to try to get out a share here first. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Um, okay. As you're doing that, think about this question. For people who might be listening, who are not a Mercedes-Benz or not a bank, how can you work with smaller or medium-sized businesses to drive, or how have you done that to drive results for them? Is it harder? Is it easier? Um, is it the same, or do you do different things? It's harder, and I'll tell you why it's harder. Uh, it's just a second. I say stop, share. Good. Here's go. why it's harder mm -hmm. to deal with a small, medium enterprise versus a big, large Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 corporation. Remember I talked about ego, corporate politics, business issues such as revenues and profits? In a small medium enterprise, you're dealing with at best, this is at best, a benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> I control, I own this business, my way or the highway. What got us here was my way. Now, if you're willing to do it my way, I'll talk to you. Well, we don't do that at Townsend and Alexander. I'm going to get to this later on. There's a new selling method out there. It's a form of relationship selling for trust and comfort. But the exact name for it is challenge selling. Right. This is a new paradigm out there. That's what works for hard-nosed executives that are tired of being BSed, tired of being soft-soaked, tired of being told what they want to hear. Challenge me. And that's what we do. So the ones that will listen to us, and we have an offer that's pretty good. We put it in writing. Say a small medium enterprise is doing, I'll make up a number, $5 million a year. We guarantee a 20% increase, a million dollars, to $6 million within one year where our services are free. And you don't have to pay a nickel for it. It's all self-funding out of the incremental profits. And we'll contractually agree to that. Now, if some egomaniac in a small medium enterprise does not want to do that, we walk. And in sales, you have to understand that word, walk. Don't stand there like a pig-headed stubborn mule slamming your head up against the wall. I'm going to close this sale. No, time is money, hamburger. Get out of there and right. go talk to somebody that's going to be reasonable. So back to how we help out small medium enterprises. We've done it and done it in a remarkable way. I can think of an internet company oh, approximately 20 years ago. They're now the fourth largest in Canada. They listened to us. We said, here's exactly what we'd do if we were you going up against Rogers and tell us, they're gonna squash you like a little bug. 
you got to get be a Monty Python. I don't know if many people in your audience remember them, the English comedy group. Now for something completely different was their mission statement. Ours is we sell results. Now for something completely different. We're an internet company who will actually pick up the phone and talk to you. We're an internet company actually email you back and handle your problem. We're an internet company that cares. Boy, did they grow. And now they're the fourth largest in Canada. That's where the business world is heading. Internet, Zoom meetings like this, getting in your car and driving to a sales call. Those days are over. We don't have the time. Time is money. And in sales, you truly, in fact, in the business world, you only have one asset. You know what it is, Marguerite? Time. Time. Mm -hmm. Time is your only asset. You waste that, all the knowledge, skills, ambition in the world go into the lake. So back to small, medium enterprises. We love working with them, especially where they have a high growth potential and we can take them to the next level. Because all of our business, and we're going to get to this later, is done through referrals. We haven't made a cold call. We founded our company in August 1984. Last time we made a cold call, it actually worked out when a mortgage company was in October of 1984. Ever since then, 100% referrals. And we're going to encourage your audience today to do that now. In fact, not now, yesterday. Do that yesterday, but we'll share with them how to do it. It's easy to say do it, but you got to know how to do it. Absolutely. That's so good. Thank you so much. Hopefully people have... Uh gotten some value already from even uh, where we we've only started right <laughs> this conversation yes we have <laughs> what are we going to be covering over the next um, uh, half an hour or so in this presentation well those uh, 10 questions that you mentioned uh, that yep. uh, you have sure. I'll go I'll go back I'll, I'll uh, share yeah. the screen again absolutely back to these questions uh, share yeah so we're going to be we going are. through 10 questions so here they are Th those are the 10 questions right okay and in those 10 questions so i'm going to be asking you every single one of these 10 questions and th what an incredible opportunity for this audience to really get access to harry and his experience okay we're going to talk about you know how he helps uh people what uh his experience is what he wish he had learned you know from the very beginning of his career he's been doing this for a very long time he's seen, sort of seen all the trends all the pitfalls all the ups all the downs he's going to give you some of the best advice that you're going to get out there um how to take what works that's traditional and match it to what's new some new technologies new ways of selling uh we're going to talk to him about frustrations and, and how the team sales teams are, are selling today, uh, what we could do better. We're gonna talk about his approach and what makes it so unique and makes it so results driven and what, what makes it work every single time. Um, we're gonna talk to him about sales failures, uh, where he sees people failing and what they can do about that. Um, we're going to ask him to give us, and we're gonna be picking his brain to give us his biggest piece of advice. So something that we could all walk away with today uh, for anybody who's in sales or who owns a business and is responsible for driving revenue, what's his biggest advice to us? Um, then we're gonna end it off by asking him about the myths of selling, um, things that all the other gurus are talking about that don't work and what does work. And I'm gonna ask him to look in 10 years into the future um, and say, well, what, do you think we should be planning to do? Everything else seems to be changing. What in the sales profession needs to stay the same or change in order to, to meet the needs? And then I'm going to open it up and say, Harry, what else can you give to us today? And we're, so we're going to be picking your brain in this, uh, in this uh, um, conversation. And uh, I know that you're going to deliver incredible value to people who are listening today. So uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. And uh, let's, let's start off. Sure. Um, so the first question is, who do you help? And how long have you been helping salespeople? Who I help is, um, and again, this is, this is bleeding into uh, another question about our frustrations with the uh, consulting business of sales process consulting, but 
yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get out there and educate Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Gonna fire them up. Let's go. Boy, boy, we're all gonna be successful. We're really. Well, now that you've done that for the quarterback, what about the fullback? What about the wide receivers? What about the linemen? What about the defense? What about them? All those people in your organization, you're gonna train them and educate them too in tandem with the sales force? No, no, we weren't thinking of that. Dumb and dumber. Would you go to a car dealership and buy a brand new car with one wheel? No, you wouldn't. You buy a car with four wheels. And coincidentally, that's what you have to educate across the board in your, co your company. There's four wheels that make a company go. Sales, operations, finance, administration. Oh, what do you say we just educate the gods of the business world here? Salespeople. We'll let the rest of them uh, just take a few courses and they'll get along. And I know they don't like the salesmen, but uh, it is what it is. No, it's not. So that's what we do. We educate sales, operations, the people that deliver the services and products, finance, the people that provide the money and pay us our paychecks, and administration, the people that provide the grease that make it all work. And if you can get them together as a team, and you can, through award and recognition, cross awards, et cetera, I remember asking some very hard-nosed service people at a John Deere dealership. I had 38 of these guys in a service shop and I had the 14 salespeople sitting on the side. And I said to the 14 salespeople, I said, would any one of you guys object giving 25% of a $4,000 commission to one of these service people who gave you a lead that you never would have known about and got the sale for you. Would you would you object? No, I sure wouldn't. I said, any of you service fellows object to getting that thousand bucks? No. And then one of the service guys, Ramrod, I, Rick, I remember him well. Ramrod said, when does this program start? <laughs> <laughs> we took that John Deere dealership in one year from a $1.3 million loss on 43 million in sales to a $4 million plus profit, a $5 million swing, just by getting the team, all four departments, sales, operations, finance, administration, working together. That's what we do. And we think we do it exceptionally well. It's awesome. I think that that is a very unique perspective. It shouldn't be unique, but it is a very no, unique perspective be. for sales educators that they are, are not looking holistically into the organization, so it's quite well, One more point I, I, I'll, I'll sure. share with you. So um, is your sales force uh, been uh, sales educated, education programs? Oh yeah, yeah, done that. Uh, when did you do that? 2018, 2000, or was it 17? Uh, we've, we've done that. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. That's like taking a shower once every three years. Things, uh, Go, go wrong, okay? <laughs> Sales, education, and for that matter, education. The former head of an international bank, international, told me on a Zoom call like this approximately two months ago, education never ends. And it's one of the reasons that we have become a worldwide bank. We've embraced that in our culture. He said, I took a program in England just three weeks ago on sales. And I'm going, if the head of international sales for the 12th largest bank in the world can do that, how come they don't do that for all their people? Unfortunately, it's, it's a mindset. And as our vice chairman here at Townsend and Alexander, Bob Coffey is fine, fond of saying, he's the former vice chairman of KPMG, the largest accounting firm in the world. We sometimes manage the bottom line to the point where we savage the top line. Translation? We control expenses so much that we drag the revenue top line down. But boy, look at all this money we spent by not spending any money, any money on education. Oh, go figure, go figure. <laughs> it's just not good to say the least. That's so right. continue. Absolutely. Well, the second question I wanted to ask you 
is um, really about well, the one thing that you wish you had known at the beginning of your career that you now know now, that you know now and have implemented and has been successful. Yes, I wish I'd known this as a young man uh, going uh, at IBM. They didn't teach us this uh, when, we, when I joined IBM in 1973. I discovered it for the first time in my life in 1984. And it was invented by a professor at Stanford University. You can still buy the book. The book is called Behavior Styles. We as human beings have four distinct behaviors. And when you understand them, the power, the selling skills, and the results that you can get are simply mind boggling. So I'm gonna share the screen and show you these four behavior styles now. Sure. They're, they're rather unique to say the least. Here they are. Okay, there's four buyer types out there, okay? And the way you remember them is redo. Here we go. Re, rooster, eagle, dove, owl, redo. R, E, D, O, four different styles. They all think and buy differently. So you better know the type of bird that's sitting down in front of you because they most likely will not be the same bird style you are. So you've got to adjust your selling style. So let's explain this rather briefly, what I wish I'd known about. This Stanford professor discovered two things. There are two unique behaviors to human beings. Assertiveness, the desire to control. Responsiveness, the desire to control myself. Well, let's take assertiveness. Here it is here. On the low end of assertive, assertive this horizontal axis, a low assertive person asks all kinds of questions. So a low, low assertive question uh, a person would respond to a question like this. George, tell me what's on your mind. And George says, well, I was wondering, could I ask you a few questions about that first so I could answer you in the best way possible? That's a low assertive person. Now you go to a high assertive person, tell. Let's go back to the same question for George, but now George is a tell person. George, can you tell me what's on your mind? Darn right, I'll tell you what's on my mind. Here's what's on my mind. We gotta do something about this, that, and that. We gotta do it now. Big difference, eh? Two completely different types of buyers. You gotta be able to handle both. Well, things are gonna get more complicated. There's a second axis. This is vertical. Here we've got reserved. I am very high control of myself. Outgoing. I've got low control of my responses. Nothing wrong, nothing bad with that either. So a person that's reserved, same question. Georgina, could you tell me what's on your mind? Yes, I, I could. Um, is there anything in particular though that you'd like me to share with you? Reserved. Outgoing. Georgina, could you tell me what's on your mind? I sure could, I sure could. Do I have some things, and you're gonna like it, you're gonna like it. Two completely different styles, eh? Now, it gets more complicated. You combine them. So these two axes intersect, and now you get four different birds. So let's go through them rather quickly. Roosters, they're assertive, they like to tell, and they're very outgoing. Think of Howie Mandel, the comedian. Big time rooster. Assertive, as outgoing as they come at Howie Mandel, okay? They want recognition as the best. They respond well to testimonials. One of the first questions out of a rooster's mouth when they meet you as a salesperson is, tell me, Marguerite, who have you done business with like me? And what did you do for them? Hmm, right. I'll give you an example in the car business now. Roosters, rather unique. They only buy three kinds of cars. Remember now, they want recognition. They buy red cars, they buy black cars, they buy white cars. Why? Because they stand out. You can see them coming for miles. White, white car, black, black car, blood red car. Now, if you haven't figured it out, which bird I am, I'm a rooster and I can't break out of my buying style. 
other than one car that my dove wife made me buy, a silver, gorgeous silver car, beautiful infinity. Every car that I've owned since I've been a young man has been red, black, or white. It would help if you knew that. Eagles, they want power and control over their environment. I don't care about a testimonial. I don't care who you've done business with. Show me the money and show it fast. Anything else you want to say before I say goodbye? Eagles are tough. You better be prepared and have concrete numbers, third-party proof, and facts in there, and they will not accept failure. You fail an e eagle, you're out of there so fast, you'll, boy, they'll give you two orders. Get out and stay out. Doves, on the other hand, they are the sweethearts of this world. Think of Ronald Reagan, our ex the ex-president of the United States. Joe Biden is also a dove, the present president of the United States. They want the approval of others. A team approach, committee, need to have a referral to talk to them. Who have you done business with uh, that I could talk to? Testimonials, what did you do for them? They don't like risk. If there's any risk, this is why you have to have a referral talking to a dove. An owl, Albert Einstein. Think of the scientist Albert Einstein, okay? They want respect as an expert. Facts, figures in writing, third-party proof. They will not tolerate mistakes. I'm an expert. I deal with experts, not nincompoops that make mistakes. You have a little spelling error or format error in your email. Bye-bye for an owl. This is what I wish. I wish from my deepest heart I'd known about this in 1973. We use it at Townsend and Alexander on an ongoing basis. Every single time we make a presentation to a group, we say, the final decision maker, which style is he or she? Uh, she's an owl. The person in charge of the operations and implementation and execution of strategy, who's that? Well, that's a rooster. Who's the person that's the users on this, going to be using it? Oh, most of them are, they're a mixture. Oh, roosters, eagles, doves, owls. Okay. Who's the technical buyer, the one that's going to vet our proposal? Oh, he's a big time eagle. Don't make a mistake with him. And lastly, who's the economic um, uh, decision maker? Oh, that's another uh, dove. Okay. That's pure power when you know that. It's pure weakness if you don't know it. That's what I wish I would have known to answer your question. Amazing. That's awesome. Because I could see how you would build your strategy based on this knowledge, right? And how to, to get to those people oh. and how to speak to them, right? <clears throat> yes. Automatic. Automatic. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming in the training that you do and the work you do, you help them to help people to be able to identify who these people are and then how to, to put this strategy together. Yeah, we to have a five, a five day uh, education program for sales, leadership, management, three different programs for three different groups. And of the five days, we probably spend a day and a half to two days on birds because it marries into the seven steps of selling completely. Product knowledge, prospecting, gaining the appointment, the sales call, presentations, closing the sale, and after sales service. Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm not exceptionally smart, but I have a phenomenal memory. You know why? I took a memory course. I took a memory course. Every single person that's in business should take a memory course. I forgot his name. Oh my God, I can't believe it. You wouldn't forget the name if you took a memory course. For instance, if you ask people, what are the five Great Lakes? I can do that in a heartbeat. Holmes, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, Superior. Holmes, in an acronym. I can repeat everything, the 26 principles of selling. I took a memory program. There's a little tidbit for the audience and they're available and they're easy, they're easy. Everybody has a phenomenal memory. You just have to program your mind to do it. And it's easy. It's not hard at all. And it makes it makes a big difference, I could tell. <laughs> Huge difference. Now, our third question today is, how does your approach, the one that we've been speaking about, marry the best of this, the, the traditional style of selling with what's happening now in the market, right? And, and where you see the market going, that old and the new. 
Okay, a um, two-part answer to that. Uh, marrying the best of the old to the new. Well, the old need satisfaction. Discover the need, need, satisfy it. Marry the new into that. How do you discover that need? You ask more questions. What kind of questions? Uh, Open-ended questions. And what are they? Who, what, when, where, why, and how? Any other types of questions? And the smart people, the ones that have been educated say, uh, yes, close-ended questions. Like, um, can we go ahead? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Any other types of questions? This is the new. Reflective questions. Reflective questions. What is a reflective question? I just asked two. Reflective questions. Did, did, did. What is a reflective question? Did, did, did. An open-ended question could be, what is a reflective question? No, did, did, did. Think of did, did, did. Anything, you, for instance, here's a reflective question. Someone can say, how are you today? And you go, hmm, let me think about that. Two reflective questions. Hmm, let me think about that. Da, 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 da. Powerful questions such as a reflective question. If you touch this the old way, we have other priorities at this time, uh, Marguerite. So uh, would you call us back, please? Two of the worst answers you can ever give. The first one's bad, but the second one is worse. The first one, um, can you call me back? We have other priorities. Yes, um, and I'll be as professional as I can at this point. Could I call you back either next week or would towards the end of the month be better? Mm, so, so here's the worst question you could response you could ever give to that though. We have other priorities at this time, Marguerite. Could you call us back? Well, while I'm here, what are those priorities? Ow, put your face up to get nailed hard. You can't do that. You have to know three types of questions, marrying the old, with the new, the old is need satisfaction. The new is asking more questions. The other thing is the old is cold calls. Remember I talked about wasting times, time? Oh my goodness, you can make a hundred cold calls. Three people will say, yes, I'll listen to you. One person will say, I'll buy your product. 99 wax in the head. Or you could do referrals the new way. 70% of all referrals out of 100, 70 people will say, I'll listen to you. Half of them will become your customer within one year, 35. That's marrying the old with the new. And that's what we do. I hope I answered that question. Um, so my fourth question oh, here okay. for you is, what are your frustrations and how are, how do you see, what are your frustrations with the way that you see teams are selling today? Oh, okay. that's easy, that's easy. As Bob Coffey, our vice chairman here at Townsend Alexander says, the fish stinks from the head down. Sales organizations are very poorly led. Leadership, the definition of leadership is motivating your people to excellence by example. Okay, let's go make this call. I'll do it, watch me, and then We'll coach you down the road so you can do it yourself. Leadership by example. Man, oh man, you ask a senior vice president of sales, out of a 40 hour work week, how many are spent with your salespeople in the field? 40 hours. Take a guess at that. We've been asking that question now for uh, 38 years. Very little. <laughs> very little, very little. And it just shocks me how badly led our sales forces are very poor leadership. And the other thing that shocks me is what's the definition of management in the sales world, a sales manager? Managing the activities of your salespeople. Good. What activities do you manage? Well, sales calls. Good. That's like steering your car with a rear vision mirror. A sales call has happened in the past. You're looking in the rear vision, covering territory you've already covered in your car. My goodness, you'd never do that in the real world. Steer your car through the rear vision mirror. And yet, have you put in your sales call report? I don't see your sales call report. Gotta see that, gotta review it. Another question we ask sales managers, 
out of 100 sales call reports you get in a month, how many do you review? Um, between you and me and the fence post, uh, maybe five. And those are the poor performers. Use it as excuse to get rid of them. But that's private. That's just between you and me here. Oh, my goodness. Frustrations. Absolutely god awful. And it starts from the top and goes down. And the poor salesman or saleswoman is at the end catching that. <laughs> Makes complete sense. And I know that you have some work that you do with sales managers to help them to start tracking and doing work on the right things, obviously, um, to, right. to reverse course. And I'm this. glad you brought that up. There's two things we don't track, which just appalls me. And uh, both not only are not tracked, we don't even educate our salespeople on them. The first is referrals. How many referrals do you have at any point in time? I personally have today, Harry Alexander, eight. Eight active referrals right now. And I know that we're going to get at least three of them as new customers within the next year. I know that for a fact. Well, that's fine. Once you have a referral, you got to see them, don't you? So, you know, how do we go ahead and pick the phone up and call them? What are you going to say to them? Hi, um, may I speak to Mr. Brown? Uh, this is John Brown talking. Uh, who's this? Uh, Harry Alexander. I'm the president of Townsend Alexander. We're a sales process consulting company. Click. Hello, hello, John. Are you still there? Brutal. How do you do that? Let me do it the correct way. Good morning. Is this John Brown? Yes, it is. My name is Harry Alexander. I just had a conversation with Marguerite Fleming, and she suggested I might want to give you a call. John, you have about 60 seconds, so I can tell you what this is about. Uh, sure, go ahead. And now I tell him, I've been doing business with Marguerite now for going on two years. I've uh, gone ahead and helped her out in her sales results in her, in her business, given our business, Townsend Alexander, we're sales process consultants. I'd like to briefly visit with you at your convenience. And when we get together, I'm not gonna try and sell you anything. I don't know what you need, John only want to see if there's a fit. Maybe we could help you out like we've done with Marguerite. Would say mid-May or later on this month be uh, convenient for you. I just went through the seven of the nine steps of gaining the appointment. Yet we do not even educate our people on how to do that. Worse yet, we don't measure it. So you see where the world of sales can get in uh, the ditch rather quickly. Exactly. It sounds like these are the basics, like fundamentals. This is you would think so. <laughs> 101, you know, but yeah. Okay. It's very interesting. Yeah. Sometimes you we need think. to go back to those things, right? And my, my fifth question for you is, what makes the approach, your sales and training and edu sales and education approach truly unique in the, in the market? Well, as one of our consultants uh, said, um, very, very uh, accurate. It ain't bragging if it's true. Well, here's what's true about us. We are the very finest among the very finest capital goods, service, sales, education companies in the world. In the world. Well, how do I know that? Because we'll guarantee a 20% increase to your top line revenues, or our services are free. And that includes all the airplane flights, the hotels, and anything else we have to incur as expenses. And we'll contractually agree to that. And now there's 12 uh, closing techniques, and I'm going to use one right now in this little scenario. And by the way, Scott, I know you're, you're talking to other sales process education companies like me. Why don't you feel free to say this? I was talking to Harry Alexander, the president of Townsend Alexander, and he told me to tell you this. He said he'd guarantee a 20% increase to the top line here in our company or their services are free. Will you do that? Oh boy, find the baby so you can burp that one quickly. They freeze. Not only can't they do that, they won't do that. We will. The senior vice president of John Deere, Scott Klaus, said, Harry, do you realize what you've just guaranteed us? I said, yeah. Your division did three and a half billion dollars last year. So we guaranteed you a $700 million increase. And you can do that. 
I said, Scott, two things. One, yes, we can. Two, gear up manufacturing. Well, you might have to go to a 10 or an 11 month backlog from a two month backlog you have today. Please do that. And by all means, check us out with other Fortune 500 companies where we already did that, such as Mercedes-Benz. That's what makes us different. It ain't bragging if it's true. It's true that we bring not the bacon home, we bring the whole herd home. I think that is one of the biggest differentiators to be confident enough to know that you are and put your, put your money behind it, right? The guarantee is not just your services, but the guarantee is on a result, which is amazing. Um, exactly. Okay, so that ties into number six. And this is, you know, we, we'd love to learn from you. What has been your biggest sales failure and how, and what did you learn from it? It could be yours or, or somebody else that you've observed. Our big, <laughs> I laugh or I cry. <laughs> We've been in business uh, now uh, going on 38 years. We get fired the same, <laughs> same way every time. Every single time we get fired, it's the same way. New management comes in from the top. You see Godzilla's foot coming down. You go, no, not us. We're, we're, we're the ones giving you tens of millions of profit. Not us. Don't whack. All discretionary spending, including us, out the door. We're bringing in our own people. We're doing it our way. There's a new sheriff in town. Me and my team. If we need your help, we'll call you. Well, that eventually does happen within three to six years, they do call us back because they rapidly find out from their field people, from their regional vice presidents who have worked with us hand in glove, look, this new way is not working. The joke's over, bring Townsend and Alexander back. That's the biggest frustrating. It's part of life. It's politics, it's egos, and there's not a darn thing we can do about it. You're muted. I think that's great because sometimes things are outside of your control, which is what you're saying, right? There's nothing yes. you can do really to prevent it. We have to accept the fact that no. things may, are, are just going to change, right? The, the some of the question I have for you is, uh, I just wanna write, read it so I get it right. Uh, what is the biggest single piece of advice sure. that you would give any sales professional leading, listening here today? So if they could take away one thing from your 38 years of experience, what could they take away from? Like one thing that we can do differently. It, this there's four parts of our lives there's your physical life your financial life your social life your personal life the relationship you have with yourself and this will cut across all four parts of your life and help you out immeasurably in your business life huge and for that matter the other three the first person you have to sell in sales and if you don't sell this person you're not going to be able to sell anybody. You have to sell you on you. Now, Tony Robbins is the only man at Robbins Research. I met him personally here at Townsend Alexander. We put all of our people through every last one of his programs. The man is a human genius. He understands the human psyche, how we think, what motivates us, what demotivates us, what keeps us going, what causes us to fail. And what causes us to fail is a negative self-image. Well, how did we get that negative self-image? Who do you suppose gave it to us? Uh, we did. Parents? We gave it to ourselves. <laughs> we gave it to ourselves. Okay, all right. Actually, uh, yes, you are correct. There are two sources of stress. One, we're worried and sometimes sick about what other people say to us or about us. The second source of stress is we feel we're not in control of our environment around us. But people actually commit suicide because of what people say about them on the internet or flipping Facebook. Yeah. It's mind boggling. So let's get back to the advice. The advice is this. If you gotta sell you on you, you better start doing it yesterday and do it every single day. I did it this morning. And how you do it is you stand in front of the mirror. Subconscious mind only believes three things. What it sees, that's why the mirror. What it hears, that's why you say it out loud enthusiastically. And what it feels, you move your arms so you can feel it. And basically it goes something like this and it doesn't matter what you say as long as it's positive and it's about you. So every morning I make something up. 
and it could be something as simple of, by goodness, if I was any better looking, I'd be in Hollywood. If I was any smarter, I'd be in Einstein. This day is my day. I'm going to be great. It's going to be super. Let's go get them. Now, you don't have to worry because nobody's looking at you. It's just you and the mirror. But your self-conscious anchors that and takes it on. And for at least three to three and a half hours, this is what Robin's research says, Tony Robbins, it stays with you. Do it again, halfway through your day. Give yourself another charge, keep doing it. Then you'll be sold on you. And when you step through the door, you know, some people walk into a room, Marguerite, and you go, who is that? 99 other people walk into a room, shadow, don't even say them. Why? It's the halo, it's the aura, it's your charisma, it's your projection. Where does that come from? It comes from the positive emotions that you feel at that point in time. The source of those positive emotions is positive self-talk. Do it steadily. Stay away from negative self-talk or you're going to get into fear, anger, hatred, and worst of all, suffering. Positive self-talk. There's only one feeling in the sales world. It's positive. It can't be negative and it can't be indifferent. How you do it, positive self-talk. Anybody contacts us, we'll forward them information on how to do it, a brief video clip. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Ask and you shall receive. That's the biggest piece of advice I could give to somebody. Be positive. Get away from those energy vampires and negative people. Do not hang around with them. You are who you hang around with. Hang around with positive, upbeat people. You'll be better off for it and your sales career will go like that. That's the best piece of advice I could give anybody. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you for bringing, you know, it's like a grounding in the fundamentals of what selling really is, which is relationship, right? It's, it's people, it's person to person. Yes, it is. And they have to like you and they have to know you and trust you. And one way to do that is- and they gotta know that you like yourself. Right, mm -hmm. very interesting, so good. I'm sure you could del yes. delve into that uh, a lot deeper. So, uh, but I think this little tidbit is, is, is great. Thank you so much for that. So my eighth question for you is, what is the biggest myth about selling that you believe needs to be debunked? This is, that, that's an easy one. That's a softball question. Um, <laughs> the biggest myth in sales that needs to be debunked and debunked immediately. You ask anybody this on the street, do you think salespeople are honest or dishonest? What's the majority answer that people will give you? Uh, um, hopefully, more honest, but usually it's going to be dishonest. <laughs> yeah, dishonest, dishonest. Right. And that's a pure myth. It's an absolute myth. It is. You know, there is that fringe in every profession. It could be architects, engineers, salespeople, doctors, lawyers, pharmacists. They happen to be dishonest. It is what it is. The vast majority of salespeople are as honest as the day is long, or they could not survive in their profession. They could not survive. Their fellow salespeople and management will manage them out of the business. You'll hurt me and you'll hurt our company and you'll hurt our sales. Salespeople are honest. They're not dishonest. It's a myth, a complete myth. However, <coughs> excuse me, that 5% can soil the other 95%. It's a myth, a complete myth. Salespeople are honest. I know they are. I've been dealing with salespeople all my life. Thank you. Um, okay, so question number nine, we're almost, we're getting there. Um, if you were to predict yeah. 10 years into the future, what are the three selling techniques that you believe will still be relevant? If you're looking into our future and seeing all the shifts and changes that's happening, what do you think is still gonna be the same, no yeah. matter what? Uh, relationship selling, which is focusing on the relationship, treating others as you would like to be treated, doing your best, doing all the right things, putting yourself in the other person's person shoes, empathy, that will still be there. But in the future, it's gonna morph 
into challenge selling. Challenge selling is where you take relationships selling and put a steel backbone in it. So a chief executive officer could say to you, look, I hate to tell you this, but we're gonna go with the old sales plan for another year and just see what works and doesn't work. We're gonna go with your award and recognition program, but we're gonna leave that compensation program. Relationship selling would go like this. I understand your situation and if I were in your shoes, I'd avoid the risk. I wouldn't take the chance of failure. Another year isn't gonna break anybody one way or the other. We can revisit it. So now let's talk about, and you'll go on. The new selling that's gonna come out in the future is challenge selling, where you ch challenge what you know is wrong that you yourself in your heart wouldn't do. So if you wouldn't do it to yourself, your family, your career, why are you gonna let your customer do it? Challenge your customer and say, Jean, if I was in your shoes, I'd think that way too. However, if I could prove to you in only five minutes that that would be a very damaging decision to you personally and to your company, would you at least reconsider? Challenge him and then have a good, tight, savage, quick, big answer. Big, brief, interesting, gone. B-I-G, be brief. Be interesting, be gone. Five minutes, challenge them. That's gonna be there, big time. That's gonna be one morph. The next morph, the next big change is need satisfaction. I have reviewed it. Need satisfaction is like a finely tuned Mercedes Benz car. Except if you don't put oil in the car, even the Mercedes Benz gonna choke, smoke up and go dead, right? The oil in the car for need satisfaction is going to be asking more questions. Sent are open-ended questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. 70% are reflective questions. Could you tell me more on that? That's interesting. Really? No kidding. Four reflective questions I asked. You get 100% more information off a reflective question than you do an open-ended question. 10% are closed-ended questions. Use them at the very end. Go ahead. No, I mean, no. <laughs> so that's going to morph big time. That's going to morph. The next big uh, change in selling is it's going to be in a Educate people in management control, cash flow, collateral, capital, orders and movements. You have to have an understanding of that. Those three big changes are going to be happening. Challenge selling, relationship, uh, need satisfaction by asking more questions, and knowing the business environment and content that you're selling into, egos, corporate politics, and business issues that you normally don't address. Salespeople usually address two business issues, revenues, expenses, with 90% on revenues. That dog don't hunt in the future. Those are the big three changes I see coming. Ah, fantastic. Awesome. There's some pearls of wisdom in here, okay, that I know that you could really dive into. So I'm hoping that people take away some of those pearls that you are sharing with us today. So my last question for you. And uh, this is an open-ended one, but if you could step in my shoes as your, as your interviewer, what question do you wish that I had asked you today that I haven't asked yet? Everybody wants to go ahead and go into the jungle and bag the elephant. I don't want to shoot a possum. I don't want to shoot a little piglet. I want to shoot an elephant. I want to shoot a big one. Well, how do you get the big account? How do you go in and get a major account that your competitor owns and has with the chief executive officer of the customer you want to rip out of his hands? How do you do that? Well, again, you have to understand how decisions are made. Well, the decisions made by the boss, the chief executive officer, the president, horse poop. I want to make a point here. Horse feathers. They don't make the decision. They don't? No. 
They're too busy strategically running the company. They're not into tactical issues of, well, we're going to buy our toothpaste over here, or we're going to buy our truck. The people that do that are the four people that serve the UDM, ultimate decision maker. They are as follows. The coach, usually a senior vice president in charge of executing services that have been hired and retained from suppliers. The users that have got to use it. The technical buyer, the person that gives the specifications, the pricing, the conditions. And then the economic buyer who evaluates the economic situation from your services or proposed services. You can make us more money. You can make us more profit. What about inventory turns? What about cash flow? Those four make the decision. And you've got to find out which one of them is the lead dog. Also, access to the decision maker is key. When you know that road and where it goes, you got to leg up on your competitor. So of those five, which is the hardest to get to? The chief executive officer, the president. There's usually a gatekeeper there that'll shoot your head off if you try to even get to that. And that's that's his or her job to shoot right. you, shoot salespeople. So you got to go to the other four. The easiest one to get to, nobody calls on him or her. The economic buyer, the chief financial officer, the controller, call them up. And it goes something like this. George, my name is Harry Alexander. I just had a suggestion from Bob Coffey to give you a call. If you have a moment, could I tell you what this is about? Now, good old George goes, Bob Coffey, I worked with him at KPMG. This must be important. Hold on a second here, where Harry. I'll get back to you in a second here. I got a call. Click. Uh, go ahead, Harry. You're in. That's what I wish you would have asked me. Those five decision makers in a large account. We don't know what we're doing. And even if we get in front of them, it's a disaster. On our website, townsendandalexander.com, there's a white paper and it's outrageously titled, 10 Steps to Doubling Your Sales Without Any Costs. One of those steps is getting a major account. How do you do it? It's free. Just go to our website and download it. Mm -hmm. That's the question I wish you would have asked me. <laughs> okay. Wow. I mean, for anybody who's listening here who does work selling into major enterprises, I mean, that's gold, okay? I mean, you just dropped some, uh, some really great wisdom for us. So um, your website, okay? If people right. want to follow up with you, you said they can go to your website, which is Towsend and Alexander. Dot. By the way, that's spelled T-O-W-N-S-O-N. People misspell it all the time. Right. Son of town, town, son, <laughs> T-O-W-S-O-N and Alexander, all one word, dot com. Okay, perfect. So they can find you there. They can download your paper. They can reach you there if they want to have a follow-up conversation with you. So I just want to say thank you. This has been an well, incredible before, opportunity. Before, before, we oh, leave, sure. before we leave, sure, sure, sure. I'm, gonna, I'm going to share something with our audience as well. Yeah. If you had unlimited prospects in sales, okay. would you be successful? What do you think? Uh, no, unless there were good prospects, no. <laughs> good, unlimited good prospects. People that have the means to pay, the ability to decide, and the need for your product or service. If you had unlimited prospects, you think you'd be pretty, pretty successful? Yep, you part of be. it. Well, well, that's what you provide through LinkedIn. That's right. We at Townsend and Alexander have gotten Oh, 20 to 25 leads through LinkedIn because of Marguerite's advice. And her program on LinkedIn is phenomenal because it's the largest business network in the world. Right. I could not think where I want to go fishing if I was a fisherman, other than the largest, most prolific lake in the world. And in this case, for business, it's LinkedIn. So you have done a wonderful job. Your services are self-funding, and we sure appreciate them here. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for that plug, uh, unsolicited. So hopefully everyone knows that. <laughs> no, you, you never asked. That's true. You, you did not ask. I did not ask, but I do appreciate it. So thank you so much for the plug. I do appreciate it. And hopefully if anyone wants to find out more about that, they know how to reach me from, uh, from, this, uh, from this podcast. So on behalf of everyone who's listening, um, you've dropped some gems sure. for us today. 
and we know how now how to find you if we want to to continue this call. Um, you are a uh, a rare person. Uh, you're not. Uh, you don't go out there. You don't share your wisdom enough. So I think this is a really great opportunity for uh, listeners to to actually have access to you and and to the success that you've had and um, to what you know works. Okay in the marketplace. So not just the hip stuff, not just the new stuff, but what are the foundations? What's the fundamentals here um, that you have to have? And if you don't have those things, nothing else is going to matter. So I think you bring that to the table and um, I hope that people take that to to heart. So um, thank you. Uh, for your time. And um, we'll make sure to continue this conversation. Please, if you have comments, if you want to reach um, Harry, if you have comments about some of the work he's, um, he's doing, if you have some questions you want to ask him, put it in the comments below. We'll make sure that Harry gets access to it. So thank you so much again today, Harry. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank for, thanks for everybody for attending. Most appreciate okay. it. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.